I mean, you know, a great drummer is somebody who, in my opinion, who knows his place in whatever it is that he's a part of. Really, the drums initially came not even from metal, but from, from uh, rap and hip hop. Because a big album for me was uh, License to Ill. Another one, you know, Beastie Boys, another one was Raising Hell Run DMC. And, and at that time, that was like years before I even had a drum kit. But I think that really got me into the, the beats because they're so essential, obviously, in those songs. And, and obviously, the vocal phrasing is also extremely rhythmic. And I think that's really one of the things that got me started on like kind of noticing that and tapping along and being excited about rhythm, you know. A few years later, after we moved to France, because my dad started working there and I was into metal and all that stuff, then it was like, obviously, you know, thrash, death metal, uh, you know, bands like Megadeth and Slayer and Napalm Death and Morbid Angel and all those bands. And that's eventually what got me into like actually playing. You know. There are so many different things a great drummer can be, you know, so sometimes it requires to be a backbone I mean, I guess that's always kind of there, but sometimes the focus is more on being a backbone. Other times it's more on spectacle or, you know, technical playing. So it really depends on, on what you're doing. But I think learning to, to find your sweet spot that fits with whatever band you're playing with or whatever music you're playing, that's super important. And that's, a, a, you know, a lifetime search in a way. I'm still working on, on figuring that out, you know, and uh, you always keep learning and you always keep finding new things that you're like, oh, if I approach that this way, it will probably work better. I mean, you never know where the knowledge is going to come from. Right. So, for example, I didn't anticipate that I would be in soil work at the time when I joined them because I was busy with SCARV and super focused on that. And then fast forward, you know, I would never f figured that I'd ever play a Megadeth because I was touring with soil work and I was focused on that. So, and then those experiences give you this new insight into like, oh, wow, this is a whole different way of doing things of course on, on you know on a band level on a business level whatever but also musically well well scarf in general was was uh was you know a big starting point for me because it was my first proper band i had a few projects before that with friends and stuff but it was never really anything serious and with scarf it was this real idea when when patrick and i decided to form the band patrick martin was the guitar player we had this concept you know we wanted we were both into metal we actually kind of started talking because of the patches on his jacket. It was like Coroner and Loud Blast and just bands we were both into. And, uh, and so our idea was to, to do something within that realm, but our own way. Like from the get-go, we were like, we don't want to sound the same as other bands. Which now in hindsight, you know, I mean, we were, he's a bit older than me, but I was 19, I think, and he was probably like 22 or something. And it's kind of cool, you know, that we were immediately like wanting to set ourselves apart, even though we didn't really know how or... So I, I, you know, looking back, I like that. But so that was that was a very important part of my life as a musician growing up, learning the ropes of the business. Uh, we, we ended up doing four albums. Translucence was the first one, just pretty much more or less self-released. It was on a very small label that a friend of ours ran, but didn't really have any experience with running a label. Um, I think the, the, the important album for Scarf was definitely Irradiant, the third one, because that's the one where we kind of started getting more um, attention in France and a little bit surrounding in Europe and started touring more or actually started touring I should say because before that was mostly weekend shows and small gigs and things like that but I was very invested in that band you know for me that was really like that was my life and everything around it you know from the obviously the songwriting and I wrote most of the lyrics but also like the presentation and the business and it was just trial and error because we didn't have much you know the internet was barely around you know so it was a lot of like just figuring it out and you know, handwritten interviews and fanzines and sending tapes around the world and that kind of stuff. So a lot of fun. From the first record on, we started working with a Swedish producer, Daniel Bergstrand. And uh, for the third one, Iradian, we actually went to Sweden and recorded the whole thing in a studio. So we invested more effort and money and time into it. And the outcome was, you know, was according. So um, that one musically, I would say, and also production wise was kind of like, you know, we were all blown away by it ourselves, like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is cool, you know, we did something cool here. And then the, the response in the following years was, you know, was really positive to that. So it felt really good. So the funny thing is, so when Irradiant was coming out, like was getting ready to be released and stuff, um, that's when I got a call from uh, the, the, actually the label manager, uh, Lauren from Listenable Records, who was, you know, releasing Scarf, but who had put out the first two Slow Work albums uh, some years prior. 
he said, um, hey, Peter, Richard from Sorwork would like to talk to you. Can I give him your number? So I'm like, sure. And um, so Peter calls me and says, hey, we need a drummer for uh, this European tour. Would you be able to do it? And it turns out, you know, we didn't have that many shows with Scarf at the time. So I'm like, sure. So I did that tour. It was like a uh, winner of 2004 and went well. And, and, you know, that was kind of the start of, of that story. So, so it was kind of a conflicting period for me because I was realizing with soil work, you know, kind of to go back to what I was saying about being a good drummer. I was realizing, wow, that this is a whole nother level of everything, you know, like just the way everything is set up and, you know, touring in a bus and, you know, there's a tour manager and like just things we, I didn't even know what that was. You know? <laughs> so, um, so it was this whole nother step. And then at the same time, I have this very strong attachment to, but we have this cool album with Scarve and we've been working all these years to get here. So I was very torn because the solar guys said kind of early on, do you want to join the band? And I was like, ah, I don't know, like, yes, but no, you know. So it was that kind of situation went on for a year and a half until they finally said like, okay, like you need to make a decision. I think we were here doing Ausfest in 2005 in the summer. And that's when they kind of like, you know, brought the hammer down. Like if you're not going to make a call, like we're, we're going to have to maybe find someone else because we can't just have a session drummer forever, you know? So that's when I was like, okay, you know, so I, I made the call and moved on and, and it was really hard leaving Scarf behind, but um, I learned over time that, hey, that's how it goes. You know, sometimes you just got to do what's right and what feels right. And we did have our issues with my band and and, um, and just seeing where solo work was at. I just kind of knew that it was the right thing to do. You know, if I wanted to be a, a musician and I wanted to do that for my life, that was the right way to go. So stabbing the drama was fun because it was also done in, uh, with Daniel Bergstrand in his studio. So I was already used to that, having worked there with Scarf. So there was, you know, it was friendly atmosphere. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, and yeah, I just have nothing but good memories of that. Lots of craziness, you know, lots of still drinking at the time. So lots of, <laughs> lots of crazy nights running around in the snow at night and, <laughs> you know, Sweden. But um, stabbing the drama ended up being a really, you know, kind of important album for the band, especially here in the States. We did a lot of touring and uh, people loved it. So it kind of raised the profile. And uh, with Soul Work, the unfortunate thing is we always kind of had this this roller coaster. The next album was kind of a dud, you know, it didn't really do what we wanted it to do despite our best efforts and Peter had left by that time. And so it was always kind of this up and down thing where it, it just over time it just kind of felt like we just couldn't get lucky and get where, you know, the higher place we wanted to go. Uh, the Living Infinite though was a really cool one too because we that was like a double album and we spent quite a lot of time preparing for that and, and in the studio for that. Uh, that was done in Sweden with Jens Bogren um, when he still had his his old studio, uh, which was this old big farm in the, in the in the countryside, and it was just a great atmosphere because you could go outside. I remember one day I was just struggling with some drums, and I was like, "Okay, I'm just gonna take a walk, clear my my head," and like you walk out of the studio, and there you are in the fields with cows and horses. You know, like there's like literally that's all there was. So it was a cool place to just kind of be separated from everything and, and focus. And I think that actually contributed to that album being what it is. You know, it has kind of a magical atmosphere to it and a lot of inspiration. Everybody in the band was writing music. And so, you know, we just ended up having way too many songs. I think we cut like <laughs> a bunch of songs, even though it has 20 songs on it. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, working with him was just the funny thing is, is as, as serious as his music can be and, and, and his concepts and all that stuff. And it, it's very deep. It means a lot to him. He's also just a hilarious dude. And just spending time with him, especially on deconstruction, was like just, a, you know, two weeks of just laughing our butts off the whole time. Like it was just as serious as it was like we, you know, he counterbalanced that with just total nuttiness. Like some of the stuff on that record, like I remember, you know, this is something I, I had done in the past, like when I was goofing around with my cousin or whatever. And, and we were in the studio and he was just like any crazy idea. You know, what if I take a bunch of drumsticks, like I had like all my sticks and like just throw them on the kit. Yeah, yeah, let's record that. So that's actually in a song, you know, just me dropping like 30 sticks and it's like <laughs> she's just hitting everything at once. And that's actually in a song. So it's like that was the kind of shit we were doing, you know, just anything that can enhance the, the complete madness that is deconstruction. So. There was a lot of fun and, and just joking. And yeah, we did a hip hop song. I mean, you know, <laughs> it went all over the place. And so I, I just, I love that because I, you know, I mean, I'm really serious about my drumming too, but I also love just having fun. So that was an interesting thing for me because I had done some 
session stuff uh, before that. So this was around the time of Scarf, you know, Soul Work starting. I had done session gigs here and there, but then with Aborted, it was the first one where it was like kind of an established band, you know, like that was a little bit more known. So it was a bit of pressure. The story with that was that we went to Denmark uh, to uh, Jacob Hansen from Invocators Studio. And when we got there, we drove there all the way from, basically I drove from France, picked up the guys in Belgium and, and went there. And when we got there, he had a bunch of gear that wasn't ready. So, cause he had renewed a bunch of stuff. I think he was relocating and a bunch of stuff hadn't arrived. So, and we had, you know, we had our dates. We had like a little cabin rented to stay in. So all we could do was wait. So we waited, we waited and it was like three, four, five days just sitting there like, damn, you know, we can't do anything. Jacob's like, sorry guys, it's almost like he's like frantically plugging everything in all day, you know? So finally it's ready. So by that time, I'm just like a ticking time bomb behind the drums, you know, because I've been so like eager to, to just do it. And when you just, all you have to do is sit around all day, watch movies. I mean, it was fun, but you know, it was like this tension built. And Sven, the singer, is a good friend of mine. He was in Ben C with me, you know, he was like, just like playing me stuff to keep me motivated. Like, have you heard Rotten Sound? I was like blown away by that, you know? So that was like motivating me. So by the time finally we got to the recording, I was just, on fire you know i was just like let's do this and so the whole drums for that album were recorded in like a day and a half which i've never done before or since you know so yeah and, and people ended up loving that record you know it ended up being a somewhat a, an important record for them i guess kind of a milestone and none of us had any idea we were just whatever so it's it's fun to see that you know and and, and it taught me a lot about studio work that's actually i think a very important starting point for me about spontaneity because with scarf we used to rehearse every day, like everything was super prepared. And I started kind of getting tired of that, you know, as a, as a musician, just playing the same thing. Like, okay, this song goes like this and this fill goes like that. I'm sure as a drummer, you can relate to that. And with Aborted, I realized like, man, it was super unprepared and it ended up being this fireworks of stuff just because I just played whatever in the moment and it was cool. So that's something that I've been trying to harness ever since and build on and just the improvisational aspect. And a lot of it obviously has to do with confidence as a player right. that basically happened because peter witchers uh from soil work was producing and, and writing most of the music on that album and so uh he called me and said hey would you be into doing this and i was always a big nevermore fan big fan of world's voice and just the band in general you know i thought they were amazing and so um uh, it was basically just me and peter in the studio you know he had the demos and we went in and that was Probably the first time I had to play as sparsely as, as I did on that record. I was used to just, you know, playing everything all at once, splashes and toms and thousand cymbals. And with this, it was like, okay, like this is not that kind of music, you know? So I had to learn to just focus on the groove, the swing, keep it simple and, and whatever little thing I was doing for it to be in the right place at the right time. So very cool um, learning experience when it came to that. And again, one of those things where you never know where the knowledge is gonna come from. That was one of those random things that I learned a lot from because I was like, okay, playing with restraint. I've heard about that before, but it's hard. <laughs> it's not easy at all, you know. You know, with Scarf, I was very involved in, in everything around the band, you know, being my first band. It was, that's the way it went. But um, the other thing about it was that, like, songwriting-wise and stuff, even though I contributed ideas, it was mostly on drums. It was mostly, you know, I did bring some riffs here and there, but I always had this kind of feeling about, um, you know, oh, the guitar players, they really know how to play guitar. My guitar playing isn't really worthy. And then that kind of continued with solo work, which just stellar guitar players, you know. And then um, Hannah, actually, my wife, uh, kept encouraging me and saying, you can make your own music, you know, you, you can do it. And I didn't believe in myself, really. But she just convinced me to just try it. And that's how Ben C started. And... And I'm really thankful that she did because, you know, nowadays, like, that's a really important thing for me. It's my own expression, just limitless. I can do whatever I want. And it really built a lot of confidence um, uh, just in general, you know, because, of course, I love the drums and that's always going to be the case and my main instrument. But I've always loved music. I've always loved songs, you know, just albums, concepts, whatever. And so now that I've built that kind of liberty in my mind and my heart with Ben C to be able to just... If I have an idea, just make it happen, just do it. Don't be held back by, you know, maybe you think you're not as good as this guy or whatever. No, just do it, you know. Yeah. And that's something I've actually been trying to pass on to my own students as well, because I realize a lot of people 
struggle with that kind of thing or they want to do something but they think for some reason they're not qualified or oh it's not going to be up to the standard and how do you know if you don't try it you know just figure out a way to, to make it happen. I mean, the first Ben C uh, EP, which came out in 2011, I did in like a few days. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just like, whatever, if it sucks, I, I just won't play it for anybody. I won't put it out. And, you know, it ended up being okay. And of course you grow from there, but just take the first step and see where it takes you and just follow the adventure, you know. I did a, a fill-in uh, session gig with uh, Satyricon in 2014 on the, I think it was the 70,000 tons of metal. And uh, they, they needed a drummer. And so kind of last minute I filled in, which was a really cool experience in itself. Learned a lot from that. Two days to learn a lot of music. But um, so Anders Auden uh, played bass with them and, and still does. And, and I remember that name. I was like, are you Anders from that old Norwegian death metal band? You know, so he started chatting about that and, and he was surprised that I even knew the band because at that point they hadn't done anything in a while. Uh, but I was a fan from Hallucinating Anxiety. Like that was in the early days, you know, somehow I came in, in into my hands. I think a friend bought the tape. And so I've always, always loved it. I even saw him live at one point. And, and so he's like, dude, I have some songs laying around. Like we should, we should do something with them. Like, hell yeah, that's where it started. And so some years later, we did Edder and Bile, and now we have a new album that's uh, ready. It's pretty much ready. It's going to come out, I think, probably not in the early 2023, but sometime later in the year. And it's been a fun collaboration because he's a great guy and super open-minded musically, and we just get along, you know. So, so it's fun for me. It feels like working with one of my childhood underground heroes, like, <laughs> you know, kind of like a lot of the stuff I've done with Shane Embury and, and Mitch Harris. And, you know, those are all people that, you know, yeah, they're not like superstars in the sense of like, let's say a Dave Mustaine, but, but, um, but they're people that to me were very important in my musical education and whose music I still listen to. So it means a lot to me to do that stuff. Yeah. When you're in this position where you're doing a lot of stuff and people start to know that, you know, oh, this guy is, is capable of jumping in. If he needs to, then you start getting those requests. They start coming to you, you know, kind of the same with, with studio session work. It's something that I didn't actively pursue for a long time. I didn't even have anything saying, hey, I'm available. It just kind of through word of mouth started happening and same with live stuff. And so uh, with At The Gates, for instance, Adrian couldn't get in the country because of a visa issue, so they needed somebody to just fill in until he was able to fly in. And again, it was one of those things where I think I had like a day, you know, to learn. It wasn't many songs, but thank God I like At The Gates a lot and <laughs> know a lot of their stuff, you know. But but it's it's fun because those things where you're really put under pressure to learn stuff in a short amount of time, it tests your limits and you learn about yourself again. You know, you learn about what are you capable of doing, like... You also want to have fun doing it, so you want to be on stage and still have a blast, even though in your mind you're like, oh my God, I hope I don't forget any of these song structures or screw anything up, you know, and you want to do the band's justice, like Testament, same thing. That one I actually had some time to prepare, but, you know, it's a big deal. And uh, for me, like, I love all these bands and I wouldn't want to screw that up. So so it's, um, it's a good exploration of that kind of panic zone of your brain where you're like, Oh my God, no, I, I got to nail this. And the more you do stuff like that, the more confident you feel, you know, I think that contributes to me now with Megadeth being able to go on stage and just have a blast because I'm like, yeah, I know these songs. This is cool, you know, and even sometimes Dave will say, hey, can you guys learn this one for tonight? And then we'll actually play it that night. You know, that's happened a few times. And it's like, okay, <laughs> but you know, like, yeah, that's the gig. You know, you think of Bruce Springsteen, you think of you know, where people have to learn hundreds of songs. You think of Prince who would just call songs on stage. I mean, that's what the big artists do. You know, they, they just, they have this big repertoire. And if you're a part of that, you better know it. So I'm like, yeah, that's cool. You know, it's kind of a little bit of that, but in metal. Yeah, so I'm, um, I, I call, you know, just uh, on tour with Slow Work, received a call from managers that Dave Mustaine wanted to talk to me, kind of out of the blue and okay. And then it was initially going to be a fill-in gig. So when I spoke to Dave, he said, we just need somebody to do some shows with us that our drummer can't do. And um, I said, cool, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I happened to have some time after that tour, about 10 days to learn the set, which in my mind, I was like, that's cool. I got that, you know, no problem. So, um, but then once we were doing the shows, Dave basically said to me, okay, I want you to join the band, you know. And, and I was like, are you sure? You know, I mean, you you have this guy and I have my band and, but he was basically like, you know, when Dave, 
he knows what he wants, like that's what he wants, you know. So he made it pretty clear to me that like I'd better make up my mind and you know if I was gonna do it or not. So of course I was like talk to the slower guys, talk to my wife and everybody's like, Are you crazy? Like of course you gotta do this, you know. So like, okay, so here I am, you know, we, we did a lot of touring for the previous record Dystopia in the first years I was in the band, which I thought was fun and and good because I got to experience things at, a, at, at this level that, you know, I, I touched here and there with some big festival shows, but with Megadeth, it's continually just massive audiences, you know. And of course, that's fun. Of course, it makes the, the shows even more, you know, that much more exciting. And it also really gave me um, um, kind of a license to, to learn everything in detail, all the back catalog stuff. We play a lot of the older stuff mostly and the new stuff, but um, I got really familiar with <clears throat> like Nick Menza's approach, Gar Samuelson's approach, you know, and that was cool because when it then came time to sing the Dying and the Dead, which the new album, um, I, I felt like having all that knowledge and all that kind of experience with those things was really able to inform how I was going to approach my own drums because it felt important to me to respect the legacy of the band. You know, that was really something I felt strongly about. I know some people will say, oh, why don't you just go in and be yourself? I mean, that's going to happen regardless, you know. I can't not be myself. So you'll hear a lot of things, I think, on the album that if you know my drumming, you'll recognize. But at the same time, I felt as a fan of Megadeth growing up, you know, buying Peace Cells when I was 15 or whatever, I felt that, you know, I, I wanted that element in there, kind of that, you know, there, there's a very unique rhythmic uh, sense uh, to how Dave plays and how that interacts then with other instruments. And I, I, you feel that on stage a lot too. Like he's really kind of the foundation, you know. And he'll say to me, like, you, you and I are the engine of the band. And as long as you and I function well together, then everything else that fits on top of that, you know, in a live setting will work out because the, the, sun, the foundation will be really strong and together. So... So that was, you know, that was, I felt like, wow, like I'm proud to be a part of that, you know, and it still does. And, and so I wanted to bring some of that to the new record as much as possible. They are legion and they are rabid, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's one thing I've noticed versus all the other stuff I've done is that, of course, you know, I mean, every artist has hardcore fans, like Devin has really hardcore fans that will, love everything he does and so the soil work and so the scarf at some level you know even though we're always just an underground band but with Megadeth it's like it's another realm you know it's a it's a worldwide thing and I think the legacy and Dave's legacy as a musician everything he's done you know just the the, the aura that he has that turns you know that that turns the passion into an even deeper thing you know I mean I, I've countless times I've seen people cry because they meet Dave you know or get on their knees and just be like, oh my God, I love you so much. And it's like, he just, he means so much to people, you know, and, and, um, and that's a really cool thing to see because that's kind of like how I feel about Prince, for example, you know, like I never met Prince sadly. And, and, you know, and I don't know if meeting him would have been anything because he was very elusive and wasn't that kind of person really, but it was like, there's this magical thing that you can't explain. And I think that's still in the end, what drives a lot of us to, to be musicians, you know, is that magic. Like when people see Kiss or Maiden or, you know, whatever your favorite band is, you know, for me, it'll be like Napalm Death, you know, like I said, their show at the Belasco a couple of months ago was like, I mean, it's probably the 10th or 15th time I've seen them, but it's just, I don't know, it does something to me, you know, that I can't explain why or how or what it is exactly, but it's just, there's this thing that happens that like transcends just what you think or, you know, it's just a deeper, a higher thing. And so, and, and, and with Megadeth, that's, very you know that's very much a part of the picture all across the globe you know everywhere europe us you go south america rabid you know latin america all those places is just it's just crazy so that's a lot of fun to be you know to be able to be a little part of that legacy and to kind of help perpetuate that because of course it's weird you have the whole history of the band and then you know 35 years or something and then you come into that and you're like you know sometimes it kind of feels like am i really a part of this because you know they basically did all this and I was just a fan you know yeah. and now I'm here but you know as Dave recently said we recently got a couple of gold records and a platinum record for singles it was like Symphony of Destruction I think it was um, Peace Cells and uh, Hangar 18 you know that recently went like gold and platinum and, and so you get the plaques with your name on them and I'm like holy smokes you know these are songs I listened to as a kid but Dave said you know 
you guys contribute to this, you know, to the current lineup. Like you guys contribute to these songs living on. We play them every night when we play. They keep, you know, see kids at the shows, you know, parents bringing their kids. Like it goes on, you know, if, if they weren't being played for, let's say, the past 20 years, they might not have gone gold and platinum, you know, because people forget and they listen to what's happening. So, so that was, I was like, okay, yeah, that's true. Like it kind of justifies a little piece of that legacy to be a part of that, even though I wasn't there when it was created or, you know, did the whole explosion in the beginning. It will probably be something off of deconstruction, I guess, because I think that was just, you know, drumming level was just through the roof. Devin just, he wanted to make the craziest record, like take all the most insane ideas and just materialize them. And, and so some of that stuff was like, wow, you know, and I would say tracking it was hard, even though we were having a total blast. But the hardest thing was the next year, um, he decided to do four shows in a row in, in uh, London. And it was a uh, key um, addicted deconstruction and ghost. And so one show each night. And so um, he asked me to do the deconstruction. Also, we all did a couple of songs of key, but um, so it was learning that live set, learning that album front to back. <laughs> like, man, like, I don't think I've ever spent as much time studying for just one show, you know, like he would even come and rehearse at my house at the time I lived in Cleveland for, for a few years and uh, they would come through town and he'd come to my house and we'd rehearse together for the show that was like four months later, you know. It was just, yeah, that album is just something else, man. <laughs> but I love it, you know, we, we did pull it off with very few mistakes in the end and, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, I've always loved those kinds of challenges, you know, where it's really just... I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna make it happen, you know, <laughs> it's fun. That's such a tough question because it's such an important part in my life, but hey, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, be doing, I'd be doing animal conservation efforts, nature conservation efforts. I already do, you know, I have Savage Lands, which is about uh, the trees basically, and then I participate in other actions like what Shark Water does. Uh, those are important things to me and I think if I didn't have music if for some reason that just didn't happen I think I would naturally direct myself to that because it matters and because I want to do something that You know that matters and I want to do something that I feel strongly about, you know My thing is more about like nature is, is, uh, is marvelous to me And so that's what I'm drawn to, you know, and when I see what happens with animals on the planet um, you know, I, I, I want to just go in there and do something, you know, and so I'm happy because now being in Megadeth, having kind of a, a little bit of a platform and a mic, you know, I can actually do something. I can actually help causes just by being the face of it sometimes or just by drawing attention. So that's super cool because that gives, for me, it gives validity to everything else I do. You know, it can be a very selfish thing to be like, I love playing drums and now I get paid money to do it, you know, but to take that and to use that then for something good. It's, it's, it makes me feel, you know, like, yeah, I'm on a good path. You know, this is what I want to do.